This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at BakerStreetIrregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the cyclist was solitary, the bachelor was noble, and the resident was patient, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? On which three continents did Watson have experience of women? When did 221B Baker Street first get telephone service? And why does Holmes prefer telegrams over writing? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 182, Ships Ahoy. Hello and welcome back to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at some of the minutiae in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, have you, have you shipped out this summer yet? I've got everything very ship shape. Ship shape. Well, you're wearing your boat shoes. So that's, that's a good start. <laughs> I can't put my boater on because I've got these headphones. <laughs> But you know, uh, just by the way of speaking of summer and summer attire, um, last week I was on a, uh, a video call. Uh, it was an interview and I, I donned my seersucker jacket. I was wearing shorts. Don't tell anyone, but I, I love my seersucker suit because it feels like I'm wearing pajamas. It is probably one of the most comfortable outfits that I have. And lo and behold, the day after we, we shot that interview, I discovered that the day that we shot it was actually not to my knowledge at the time, National Seersucker Day. Oh, you're kidding. No. Well, I shouldn't be surprised because <laughs> there's a national day for everything. Of course. You mean, there's, first of all, there's a National Seersucker Day, so I am surprised. But second, I missed it. I, I know, right? But it just attests to my sixth sense in the fashion world that, that I would put a seersucker suit on unknowingly on National Seersucker Day. Well, yes. And let's move from the seersucker material to the linen of sails as we get prepared to uh, to be ship shape and talk about ships in the canon. Just a reminder: this episode is 182. You can find it at ihose.co slash trifles 182, all lowercase, and that'll take you to the show notes, which go to sherlockholmespodcast dot com. That will, in turn, give you an opportunity to comment. Uh, to help support the show, we've gotten a few new donors in recently for as little as a dollar a month uh, to help support what we do here. And every amount is appreciated. So thank you for doing that, for making this discussion of Sherlock Holmes and his associated facts and stories available to everyone. So let's get down to the docks and establish what it is we're going to be doing here. Um, you know, as much as uh, the last episode was one of our regular features of looking at a piece of old scholarship, I was inspired by a couple of pieces of old scholarship, and I'm not looking to uh, to, to parse them out, uh, but just to reference them uh, as part of this. I was reading, geez, I, I think I happened across a uh, a Don Redmond article in the Baker Street Journal in 1986, volume 36, number four. Uh, it was, a, uh, an article titled Ship Ahoy, Captain Basil. Of course, Captain Basil was the, what was the alias that Holmes used in Black Peter as he was out hunting for, uh, the culprit. And Redmond in his opening paragraph mentions Richard W. Clark's piece on the nomenclature of Watson's ships, which was in the very first volume number two of the Baker Street Journal. So I thought, well, here's a, here's an interesting pair of articles that looks at uh, something that we haven't explored here on Trifles, and that is some of the ships that we come across in the canon. And I thought, looking at these in particular, 
um, might be interesting because it could tell us something about Watson and his mindset, and it might just help us think about the, the, the overall subject of ships in the canon. So why don't we start at least with Clark's piece as, as the backgrounder, and then we can get into Redmond's uh, references because, because Don Redmond was, he indexed the BSJ for a number of years, the Baker Street Journal, and he uh, was a consummate researcher. Uh, he was a librarian by trade, uh, and and his work is uh, is is still a wonderful reference to have. So he went through and cataloged a lot of uh, things regarding the ships, but he used Clark's article as the jumping off point. And Clark says, you know, he says, Let, let's look at some of the the famous names in the in the Sherlockian ships, the Matilda Briggs. Right, the Matilda Briggs, of course, was the one that's associated with the giant rat of Sumatra, as mentioned in the Sussex Vampire. Uh, he said the Matilda Briggs was indeed owned by the Oriental Trading Company of Shanghai. I mean, he says the bark Lone Star, which is from the Five Orange Pips, was found in the Georgia Register, owned by the Johansson brothers of Savannah. So he's he's going through and cataloging actual ships that existed and kind of matching up as much as we talked about in the last episode the the historicity of these nautical vessels with regard to the Sherlock Holmes stories. <laughs> yeah, he is and it's a wonderful list and it surprises me, you know, when I read this paragraph and again, you know, this is in the old series of the BSJ. So this is the first volume of the big, all back there in the 1940s. But it's a fascinating paragraph because, as you say, he goes through all these ships and lists them and says, among other things, the steamship Friesland was accounted for under Belgian rather than Dutch registry. And he says, Christopher Morley has sailed aboard her. Uh, and then he goes on and says, the sea unicorn uh, of Peter Carey, the Brig Hotspur, the Bass Rock, the Palmyra, the Rock of Gibraltar, where Jack Croker was the first officer, have all been more or less <laughs> authenticated. <laughs> I love that. And, yeah. and that, that phrase in particular is really what set Don Redmond off. <laughs> Because he, he quotes that paragraph in the intro of his own article, and then he says, more or less authenticated? <laughs> yeah, he says, chapter and verse, or at least page and date of the registry would be very desirable proof. Uh, but these sweeping claims made by Clark bear scrutiny and confirmation. And that's where, uh, that's where he goes, uh, one by one through, um, a number of ships. I think I'm, I'm going to see how many there are. It must be at least uh, two dozen here that he lists. Mm. Well, it's interesting. You know, it, it would be an, it's a nice thing to review for our listeners, the difference between boats and ships. You know, this comes up perpetually and we have folks in the Baker Street regulars, you know, who are great authorities on maritime life and who have written scholar, many scholarly things about, shipping and transport and so on in the world of Sherlock Holmes. But, um, you know, basically the key here is that boats are small and ships can carry boats and ships are built to carry cargo or passengers or uh, boats. And so a ship, ship is big, cargo passengers, boat is small, and it's used as a generic term for a whole variety of uh, things that bubble around on the water. Indeed. And, uh, Walter Jaffe, uh, who is a, uh, yes. a sea captain, a uh, member of the BSI wrote an essay, uh, called At Sea on Ships and Boats, um, which I think he delivered at the Chautauqua conference, uh, but then it made it, made it into, uh, Mobile Homes, the book Mobile Homes. And, uh, yes. he, he outlined, um, the, the various types of boats and ships that were mentioned in the canon and illustrated exactly what they would have looked like. Well, more on ships and boats and what Clark and Redmond had to say in just a moment. Would you read it on a train? 
Would you read it in the rain? Could you read it in the car? Read it now, wherever you are. Whether on a train, in a car, in the rain, or wherever you are, Mobile Homes is an excellent book to have with you. This volume from the BSI Press is edited by Walter Jaffe, and it takes us on a journey through Victorian transportation. From human-powered vehicles to steam-driven engines, we find examples from the Sherlock Holmes stories from land, sea, and air. Read about various modes of transport that span walking, biking, horse-drawn conveyances, locomotives, ships, boats, and submarines, zeppelins, and more. You could read this on a train. You could take it on a plane. Try mobile homes in other ways. Go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. Uh, we're back at three bells here, uh, ready to discuss the rest of uh, the ships in the canon. So, what 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 struck me in in Clark's essay was how he mentioned there were a number of ships. And this isn't uncommon, uh, but there are a number of ships named for women. And I think it's a, a typical uh, nautical custom to refer to the sailing vessel as a she. Uh, you know, in modern parlance, it seems rather sexist, but it's just part of the, um, part of the nomenclature that, uh, nautical life has, um, evolved. We mm-hmm. have, let's see. Well, the, the, the cutter Alicia, which, Clark mentioned. And then we've got the Gloria Scott, the Nora Crana, and the Sophie Anderson. You know, four ships right there named for women. Now, what are we to make of this? You know, Watson and, and, and the fair sex being his department. Do these names have any significance? If, if we haven't been able to locate them on a register anywhere, are these women that were in Watson's, uh, three continent experience? of the past and he honored them with the name uh in the canon well it's wonderful speculation you know the the reason why there's a feminine rather than a masculine name for for ships i think is because uh of the idea of safety and protection and you know sort of the sea as uh, as a mother that would protect these people on their journeys like a mother watches over her children and so on mm. um so the idea of making that link between a feminine name and someone who mattered a lot to Watson, um, I suppose I would tend to feel more comfortable if I were on board the Irene Adler rather than on board the Jerry Seinfeld, as you know, just sort of an example. <laughs> so, so I guess, you know, I, I'd probably be buying more things from the, from the gift shop if I was on board the Irene Adler than if I was. I like you know, that. Well, yeah, what if what if you were on the King of Williams. Bohemia? <laughs> you know, they, they, all ships' photographs are free, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, interestingly, as as we look at Don Redmond's research, the cutter Alicia, uh, which sailed into a patch of mist and disappeared. This this, of course, was mentioned in uh, Thor Bridge. He said several Alicias are to be found, but Lloyd's register of shipping does not cover small boats and whether cutters like alicia or steam launches like the aurora those would not be in lloyd's register however there is a uh, an alicia listed as a wood bark uh, broadhurst master built 1877 Um, perhaps that was the source of the reference that came out of holmes's mouth Mm. well and rod and redmond you know, is actually found an Alicia built in 1877 that was wrecked in March of 1891. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about, what else did we have? We had, uh, the Nora Crana. Nora Crana. This was mentioned in the resident patient. He says there, there was a, a, a literary reference in, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's, uh, The Wrecker, which was first published in Scribner's in 18, 18- 91. So that, that may have been on the mind as a result. But he says there was a, uh, there was a long lived Nora Crana, an iron paddle steamer, uh, that was built in Glasgow in 1878. Hmm. Splashed her way to and from the Irish coast for many years. 
Hmm. And if, if Doyle sailed in her, he would surely recognize the origin of its name. Well, I mean, that is interesting. And then Stevenson, you know, was also at the University of Edinburgh with Conan Doyle. Mm-hmm. And so that is interesting. I know absolutely nothing about the name Nora, Cre- Nora Crana. Yeah. C-R-E-I-N-A. Interesting. Yeah. And then we have uh, Sophie Anderson, the bark Sophie Anderson. This is uh, uh, the loss of the British bark is sandwiched between a furniture warehouse and the island of Ufa. And that delightful jumble of casual illusions that Watson tossed off in his preliminary to the five orange pips. He, he says, uh, Redmond says, uh, persistent efforts should unravel these minor rip mysteries, but it doesn't seem likely that the solution to this one lies in Lloyd's register. Just as mysterious as the Gloria Scott was, so too, uh, is the Sophie Anderson, uh, since Lloyd's uh, doesn't uh, have an index of anything like that. Mm. But interestingly enough, he says, you know, there was a Sophie Anderson, but spelled differently, not Sophie, S-O-P-H-Y, as it is in the canon, but Sophie, S-O-P-H-I-E. Sophie Anderson, a painter born in Paris in 1823, huh. the wife of an American and longtime resident of Capri. And perhaps, he says, Watson or Holmes or somebody else, strolled through the picture galleries and seen her work for, he says, some have been in the Royal Academy. How about Interesting. Hmm. Well, and then finally, uh, it would, I mean, there, there's uh, obviously a number of other ships to, uh, to talk about, but, but, uh, in terms of the female names, Gloria Scott, all right, th- this is a ship that actually afforded an entire canonical tale, its name. Um, and, and Redman very correctly states that there are no ships of this name in Loy's register. And in fact, names of minor characters and ships in the canon may, in many cases, be fairly readily identified, but major names are the ones that often cause difficulty. And yet, he says there are, uh, a handful of, uh, suggestive entries that may account for the Gloria Scott in Lloyd's Register. There is the Gloria, a wooden bark, uh, built 1880. Uh, that was abandoned in 1897. Uh, there was Gloria, the wooden brig, built in 1866, port of registry, uh, Krugero, Norway, wrecked July 1898. And Gloria, another bark, uh, built in 1869 uh, out of Genoa, uh, and abandoned around 1880 or 1881. Hmm. But I, th- Interesting. I suppose with, with the Gloria Scott, the, the key is it's, it's, it's destruction or it's loss. Uh, that was the, the big takeaway from that story. Uh, and, and having a ship that was registered that was then, you know, deregistered or, or lost, that, that would be key to, to that. But, you know, to me, it, it all, it, it all comes full circle in, uh, in Redmond's conclusion, where he talks – because Don Redmond w- actually looked at a lot of the uh, proper names in the canon, the character names, and where the inspiration came from. And he says, we can therefore propose that Arthur Conan Doyle did for ship names as he did for personal names. He used real names when it would serve his purpose and presum- presumably save him some effort. Uh, and when it did matter – now, perhaps since the illusions were trifling, but added to the verisimilitude of detail. So he could hmm. have, could have come across, uh, shipping registries or listed names in the newspaper, uh, in his travels, uh, in individuals that he happened to come across, such as Sophie Anderson, uh, the, the painter. Uh, the influences were, uh, certainly numerous. Yes, well, and he goes on to say that some few of Doyle's ships and crafts, the Aurora, perhaps the Gloria Scott, the Lone Star, despite mudflats and disasters, continue to sail immortal literary seas along with the Flying Dutchman and Captain Ahab. (laughs) And that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. 
Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Bite on that, Captain Crocker. And try not to let your nerves run away with you.